Uh, thanks for joining, Benjamin. It's uh, super cool to have you on this podcast. You have uh, 20 years of experience in government contracting and you specialize in the tech industry, which is which is very cool. So I'm super excited to discuss uh, with you what can recruiters out there do to improve their personal brand? Because for you, I mean, after 20 years, everyone must know you, right, in, in Washington and around. But what can other people do to actually uh, build their brand and, and stand out in the crowd? I'm definitely excited to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. It's one of the things that I realized years ago is as a recruiter, I want to be known for how many positions I fill. I want to be known for how much work I do. and at the end of the day, I remember one time when I got laid off, I was like, but all the work I've done. So I kind of realized over the years that the thing that can make you stand out a little more above like the rest of the recruiters out there is building a little bit of a brand. And that's helped us like get new work. That's helped us get new clients. And that even helped like before I started, jumped out on our own, like actually getting another job. So it was a little bit of the that branding that I didn't realize was so important to the storyline that I think a lot of recruiters are missing out because I get it. Like you just want to fill the rocks and be known for what you are good at. But sometimes mm -hmm. you have to tell the story what you're good at. Yeah, yeah. And people need to have a chance to actually uh, get to know you through the story and um, get to know the story somewhere on the social media, maybe LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram. So um, what would you recommend to one of those 300,000 recruiters just in the United States. Like if someone has been struggling to get new clients and they are like, what's wrong with me? Why I'm not getting any, any clients? And they may not even know what to start with. Like, should they build a brand on LinkedIn or should they build a brand on some other social media? Like what would you do with someone who is kind of on the market, but not very visible just yet? I mean, I, I would say the biggest thing to do is like spend the most time on LinkedIn. Yes, have fun with like TikTok or yes, have fun with like Instagram. But if you, if you think about this, like where are the candidates and where are the clients? Most of them are on LinkedIn, even though they're not there on there every single day, they're at least logged in like once or twice a month. And the, the, the first thing I would start doing is start telling the stories of what you're doing. Like if you're doing like a search for something, start talking about that search. Or like if you actually had some successful placements with some people in a really niche skill set, actually say that. Do you know how like so few recruiters share the story or share what the, what's happening? And that little bit that you could do can really set yourself apart out of the other 300,000 recruiters based in the US. And I know us recruiters were, you know, either like perfect example is, I've been on LinkedIn for almost 20 years. I think I'm supposed to get my 20 year email shortly sometime later on this year. LinkedIn has changed so much that even like just a few years ago, I hated LinkedIn. I think it was like three years or even two years ago. I hated LinkedIn with a passion because it wasn't the, the old LinkedIn that I was raised in or the old, the OG days where I just share a job and that's it. it so it's figuring out how to work the LinkedIn algorithm that way you're showing up at top of mind for like the candidates in your network and for the clients in your network. Mm -hmm. well, that's a good one. And uh, it just reminds me that LinkedIn has this new feature newsletter where mm -hmm. you write something every day or every week and people get uh, notified about the post. So it could be actually good for these uh, stories, insider stories, right? And and here's what, one of the biggest thing, like you definitely use stuff like new, newsletters and all that stuff. But one of the biggest things, I went to a bunch of recruiting conferences way back before I even had like any sort of like brand. And the thing that I realized is at a lot of these conferences, these recruiters, most of them are not better than you. The one thing that set them apart is they just actually published or shared more of what they're doing than anybody else out there. And because they shared more, they became an authority expert in this space. So I actually started, my original thing was I started with LinkedIn articles where, you know, I'm not the biggest fan sometimes. I, I know I, I host a, a podcast and I'm on a podcast, but I'm not the biggest fan of taking personal videos of me. So I started writing like LinkedIn articles and like, here's, you know, the best ways to find highly cleared talent for cleared positions. And I actually, all these different tools that I tried, tested them out and talked about that. And weirdly enough, that one article that I just was sharing out there, just be like, 
to share how much, like kind of have fun and share like what I'm learning actually has brought us like a few hundred thousand dollars worth of business. Oh, wow. A few hundred so, thousand dollars. But and over the past few years, like it's an article that was like four years ago, but it like, it keeps on bringing leads because people like look for it, like find it and LinkedIn articles is great for Google SEO. But they just saw that uh, me just kind of sharing what I've learned almost automatically put me as an authority in the space that I didn't even, I wasn't even looking for. And as people are looking for help, then they were reaching out to me. Mm. Wow. That's, that's uh, super powerful. I mean, especially if you put some label on the article, uh, you know, and ideally if it starts with the dollar sign that gets <laughs> super cool. <laughs> I think it was something simple like that one was just like the top clear uh, top tools I use for finding cleared professionals. Oh wow. And then wow. I just did like a breakdown a test like A and B testing of like all these different people with like you know TSSCI security clearances, full scope poly security clearances and just how the different tools worked with finding those people and I think you know I think it was like a good 10 minute read but it's amazing how many people have found that over the years. Mhm. Mm very inspiring. And I also noticed you have almost uh, 20,000 uh, followers on LinkedIn um, or connections or both. Um, so did you have any any specific strategy in mind when you were building the uh, the following? So it, talking about the following is another thing that's really changed on LinkedIn. So if you want a good laugh, I would say a good 15,000 of those followers are from about the last 15 years. And additional, like almost 5,000 followers are from like the last six months. Wow. That's and decent. Back, back in the OG days of LinkedIn, you could only like reach out to somebody within three degrees of separation. So like we're, you know, these are the days of like the lion and like all those other things where you wanted to connect with everybody so you could reach everybody. So that was the goal. And now I'm like trying to trim down that original list just to make room because we're only maxed out at, you know, 30,000. But now it's like the way the LinkedIn algorithm is working is talking about, it's about the sharing of the stories. It's about like, you know, what you're like, you don't just share like, Hey, I'm working with an, I'm looking for an artificial intelligence expert that has experience with earth science data. You don't just post that on LinkedIn. You talk a little bit about a story of what you're posting and like the, the fun things that you're learning while you're searching about that. And that really has helped with the following. And the second thing is, uh, that's helped with the branding a little bit is I actually host a podcast also. Mm -hmm. So like doing something like what you're doing right now is a great way to one, explore the industry that you're in, create deeper relationships, and also build up that brand that those clients and those, those companies that are looking to hire you, like it really just opens those doors. And, you know, I've had a few friends that started other recruiting podcasts and when they got let go or laid off it during the tech bloodbath, that were in the United States, a lot of them were able to quickly bounce back because of the relationships that they built with the brand that they started building because of the podcast they did. And, and, and podcasts don't have to be super compl complicated. Like just, you know, hit, we're on Zoom right now, you know, get some good questions, have like kind of like have a little bit of a process lined up and hit record and just have fun. Yeah, so true, so true. <laughs> Uh, you you also mentioned TikTok, so uh, we could also uh, you know have some fun there, you know. But uh, um, do you do you um, also do some other activity on other social networks besides LinkedIn? I did a lot on Facebook for a little while. Um, Instagram is probably the one I spend the most amount of time on, and that's kind of where you see like kind of like typically the behind the scenes of what I'm what I'm doing. You know, stuff that you just don't really share on LinkedIn. Um, so Instagram is where I have the most fun. Mm -hmm. TikTok is, I, I'll just say, I think I missed the window of exponential TikTok growth. Mm -hmm. So I think it was like 2022 to 2021. If you were like posting on there, it was like automatic growth. Now it's a lot more work to try to like grow an account on there. So mm -hmm. it's, I'm there, but not as much. Yeah, yeah, but it's interesting now when you say that um, you pretty much do the recruiting job, let's say for eight hours a day or probably six, and then you spend the additional one or two hours um, creating content about what you do, if, if I kind of understood correctly, right? You are creating a, an article about the tools you are using, you experiment with some new strategies, and then you post about it. Is, is that what you are saying? 
So it's a, it's a combination of both. Like you, you see the eight hours of recruiting during the day, but like, I kind of like started talking about what I'm doing in those eight hours. When it comes to like LinkedIn articles, some of those probably take me a good like week or two to write. I'm not the best writer in the world, so it takes time. And you can, you know, use a little bit of like chat GPT or quad to kind of help, help with the idea generation or help kind of clean up the grammar since my grammar is horrible. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, you know, spin like, you know, for me, an article can sometimes take like a week or two to actually publish. But a post on LinkedIn, that that could be something that I can like write up in like five minutes. And I kind of like now most of those, like whatever I'm thinking about is kind of like what I post on LinkedIn. So those aren't as thought out as those LinkedIn articles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And those uh, short posts, those... Uh you know, kind of snippets, so we, we can say text snippets, right? So you just kind of think about what you are working on, you post about it, and then the articles are long form articles yeah. that you can use for SEO purposes that actually brings you clients and you have some upsell at the end of the article or upsell, I mean, link to a website or something, call to action. Yeah, most of the call to action is just like, hey, if you need help finding these people, <laughs> hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's powerful super cool <laughs> and i actually didn't even think about the call to action until you said that i just kind of that's it was mostly it wasn't made as a call to action it was mostly initially made as like sharing what i'm doing mm -hmm. and they kind of became a call to action because you know at least in the in the, the government contracting space finding these people are so hard mm -hmm. so yeah it kind of that it did that story became a call to action that I wasn't even thinking it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And now when you say that uh, finding candidates is uh, actually really difficult, especially in tech, obviously, um, what can people do to actually be more successful? Because once uh, recruiters start building the, um, the brand online, they may get some uh, job breaks to work on, but they may not be able to fill them. So what are some strategies to... Um, and what works for you actually to to um, make more placements? Uh, I noticed that you specialize in data science and cybersecurity. So is is this uh, the direction that you would recommend specializing? I would definitely, if at all possible, I would recommend specializing. Um, and one of the things that you have to do, if you want to specialize, you might have to spend some additional time and energy specializing yourself. So, and I could tell you a quick story about that before I go back into uh, your question is, Back when I first started recruiting, I actually I was working at an agency at Aerotech, and my job was a construction management headhunter. So I was in the construction industry. I wanted to shift towards like government contracting. So, but you know, I was had to be like eight nine hours a day just on construction. Luckily, the economy tanked, but they shifted me over to aviation. So what I did was worked eight to nine hours on aviation positions, and then I additional one to two hours, or I would say maybe additional like five to 10 hours per week. After that time working on aviation, I started like calling around to other account managers in the companies like that were focused on government contracting. And I'm like, give me your government contract recs to work on. I want to niche down in this space. I know I'm committed to what I do with my, my manager from eight to five or eight to, say eight to six, but anything after that, I use that to start building my niche and building my brand. And so that's like one of the things that you could really do is like, even if you're not in the niche that you want to start spending a little bit of time opening those doors. Secondly, mm -hmm. the reason why that helps, and this is a, like from stuff that I do to also the interviews that I do with a lot of top recruiters, having, if you're focused on like one niche, the second you get another position, you already have a candidate list built out. And the mm -hmm. candidate list are like most of the time already knows you because you've you know interacted with them or hit them up about other positions. So it's rather than having to go and reinvent the wheel every single time you do a search and do all the sourcing. And you know, there's some amazing tools out there that help with all this, but you're not having to reinvent the wheel every single time. You can literally go back and just like, you know, to the list that you already have or to like the people you've already hit up multiple times, and like, hey, here's a new position. What's your thoughts? Mm -hmm. And Talking about a superpower, I had an interview with a recruiter recently. He only works on one position. Oh, wow. Only one? Mm -hmm. Only one position. And he bills over a million dollars a year consistently for like the last like 14 years. 
he is niched down to like, it's something that made me think even more but he's niched down to literally one position and that he has mastered that across the u.s wow wow that's impressive <laughs> just the one and it's it's very really crazy now when you say it um because um i we are in touch with with people who are transitioning from non-tech to it you know through the uh, tech recruitment academy so there are people from healthcare or sales recruiting or marketing and they're like okay so i'm i'm working on uh, pharma but i also want to do it on top of it you know like both at the same time so and they say i specialize in pharma and tech you know which mm -hmm. kind of doesn't make sense anymore right but <laughs> even people who specialize in tech it kind of doesn't make sense anymore based on what you say right because it is so huge you have product managers scrum masters like all these other roles web developers so so you kind of suggest going even deeper down to choosing one out of 70 roles or two maybe three you you chose two right two roles yeah those those are the two just because like i knew with everything going on in the government contracting space there's always going to be first of all cybersecurity issues Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the, at least the U S government's always dealing with cyber threats. So there's always going to be cyber opening. So that's one of the reasons why we did that. And the data science came from my wife actually helped build and scale a data science training company mm -hmm. that did a lot of work. And that when, as soon as that sold off, so that's kind of like the reason why we did data science and cybersecurity as two of our main things. Even though we're probably not as niched down as we are, we should be. We try to stay like a lot of our recruiting, very focused on the DC Metro with the Washington DC Metro, because that's where we already have lists built up. That's where we always already have stuff. So if I get called for a position in Colorado, you know, there's, we might look at it just to see how easy it could be to fill. But a lot of times we're, we try to turn that stuff down because we, we don't have that list built out and we have to literally start from scratch and, you know, depending on time, depending on all these other things, you know, whether you're internal, whether you're agency or whether you have your own recruiting business, you always have to like, look at like, be closest to the money while also doing the best to serve your clients. And mm -hmm. if serving your client means that you have to turn down a position that sometimes is the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. And when you say the list, um, how many people... I mean, would you suggest are on some reasonable list? Um, not necessarily yours, but what what is the number that is um, you know, good enough to make some placements? I mean, it's it all depends on the space. So if you're looking at like you know, uh, so we are primarily focused on like I said the DC metro with different levels of security clearance. So we have a kind of like our lists already built up of the different levels of security clearances and the different skill sets. And, and to top that off. The weird thing about the Washington DC Metro, people in Virginia don't want to, uh, Washington DC is kind of squished in between Maryland and Virginia. People in Maryland don't want to drive to Virginia and people in Virginia don't want to drive to Maryland. So you mm -hmm. have to like segment your list down even more because of just for that. So, you know, it's kind of like a hard question to truly answer because it's a little different for every spot. But one of the things that you can easily do is hop on LinkedIn Recruiter or hop on LinkedIn Sales Navigator. And you can really break down of how many people are in a market based on a job title in a specific ge geography or in a specific part of the United States. And that's, your, that's a great place to really start and figure out what that list is. Mm -hmm. And this, this is really interesting also because there are some agencies that promote that they have a database of 300,000 people, right? Um, but they may not know pretty much anything about them, right? And the CVs could be outdated and the people might have changed their emails or whatnot, right? So based on what you say, it's kind of, it's it's better not to have the database of 300,000 uh, IT professionals. I mean, here's the thing, like back in the back in the day, before all these crazy tech tools that we have now, a 300,000 person database used to be a selling point and a differentiator. Nowadays, your client clients don't give a shit. They don't care because they also know that like, you know, you can hop on Chatterworks, you can use Seekout, you can use Hirees, you can use all, use all these tools that create a database in almost instantly that is actually probably a little more fresher than the people that have been sitting in a database for mm -hmm. the last 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you almost have to like, one of the ways you have to like differentiate yourself don't just like hang on the hat of your legacy database, hang on the hat of like being a little more niched. 
Mm -hmm. And then you need to engage with those people, right? So that they know you, you know them, yep. you build a relationship. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> next there, next level. Next level, really. Come there there's some there's some people that like probably get annoyed with the emails from me, but like it's kind of funny. They're like, not you again. Thanks for the email. Then like what's kind of funny though, six months later, they're like, hey, contract just changed. What do you got for me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, you know, you're top of mind. You know, mm -hmm. but you also got to be nice. You can't use the like the same email like template that you know recruiters have been using since 1980. You have to be a little more personalized. Mm -hmm. Like, do a little more personalization at scale. And there's like ways that you can do that. And another fun thing that's like I've been jumping into this year is using video tools mm -hmm. in my recruiting and for both clients and candidates. Like, hop on, like, cut a little like 30 second video on something like SendSpark or Loom. And like add that into your e your email sequence. Mm -hmm. That's that's a good one. Yeah. So so those tools that can enable you to record video just in the browser without any tool, no post production. You just hit the record button and that's it. Yep. And then like it it will drop it down. Like you know, SendSpark's a great one. It will drop it down and kind of you can add it to like your email structure. Because you think about this, like like a lot of these like candidates, at least like cleared space. If somebody that has a, like a data scientist that has a TSSCI and a full scope poly, they pop their resume on a website like clearance jobs, they literally have about 75 to 100 recruiters hitting them up all at the same time. Hmm. And wow. so the way that you can really set yourself apart from all those recruiters was one, make it, a, like, make it a little more personalized. And there's one, like that used to be a time intensive thing, but there's some cool AI tools that help that, that a little more now. Two, you got to be able to like add them into like some sort of marketing sequence because, you know, how busy are you? Like we all get 10,000 emails. Like, I think I probably get about two, 300 emails on a daily basis. So most mm -hmm. of the time, like I get the best response rate on the, sometimes the fifth email, you can even like drop in like a quick little video and you don't have to make it fully personalized. Just like, a, you can just like, you know, skip saying the name and make, but make it feel personalized. And you can add that into the thread and really those little things starts really setting you apart when it comes to all the other recruiters out there. That's, that's a good one. That's a good one. And um, I feel like I still need to back to the list because I Sorry. kind of <laughs> see these, well, these, these recruiters who kind of, you know, uh, usually jump from one role to another and they try to kind of look for people on LinkedIn. They do the, the sourcing and everything. And then there you are saying that you actually don't really need to do it. Just focus on one role and create the list and just focus on DC and just focus on cybersecurity. And there are probably what like 200 people 300 like this in the area i'm just kind of the on the cybersecurity side it's like a few thousand but it all depends like based on like the security clearance level but the nice thing is, is like you're going to offer this some of the like times we get positions i don't have to go looking for new candidates i spend mm -hmm. zero time like actually sourcing i just go out and hit the people that we already have at the list that we mm -hmm. already, already built out so if you get a new position, like if I'll use a perfect example of like, if something came across my desk for a software developer based in with a top secret clearance based in Texas, I've only done that search like once or twice. So I'd have to go spend a bunch of hours, like digging around trying to find those people, building out, building out the list. And it, I know as a recruiter, you don't have sometimes full control of what position you get. So you got to do what's best for you. But if you could find a way to over the next year, start niching down a little more, a little bit mm -hmm. where you can have a list already built out, like, and you have like, you know, every company that opens up a data science role, you can hit them up and be like, Hey, I already have a list of like 75 people with TSS with the full scope polys, 150 with uh, CI polys and another list of a few hundred when it comes to just top secret. I'm not having to go out there and do everything and do all the work because sourcing takes time, at least like, you know, finding those good candidates like that you're going through like a GitHub or going through like some of those little like places where you can't really find, need to find those niche candidates. It takes time. So if you can build that up now, mm -hmm. keep the list, it'll pay dividends later on. And, you know, mm -hmm. some of these lists are also things that I built out. Like I hate to say this, like five, six years ago, I still utilize an update. Oh, so oh. if you're a recruiter, like even if you're working for somewhere else, like start building like a little bit of a database, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet, whether it's a notion thing, or whether it's like, you know, one of those other places, because like, even if you go somewhere, those people are going to remember you, you were the face of that organization you were the face of that hire. So even if you go somewhere else, they're still going to remember that face, probably mm -hmm. more than the company that you worked for.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good one, good one. And uh, we were just uh, discussing with um, a recruiter from the United States. He's based in California. He's transitioning from, uh, I think, construction to IT. And we were discussing the, the town pool, right? And he was looking at the map of all these IT roles, 70 of them. And he's like, well, okay, I know I should choose one to start with, but which one? How do I know what to start with? Should I go with uh, some mainstream role or should I choose something super fancy like DevOps specialists? So what, what would you suggest uh, to people who are just starting? I mean, I would kind of like, first of all, you got the two choices, whether, you know, what's given to you versus what you, you try to chase. So if something an IT position is given to you, just jump on it, start working on it. But as the more you deal with IT, the more you'll figure out what you like the best. Like, mm -hmm. like if you start like have loving conversations with software developers and talking about how they're coding and what, co what they're coding and what they're doing and the projects that the, the programs that they're building, like start focusing on software developers. But if you like, you have a, a you figure out you have a little bit of a passion for DevOps, like focus on that. So you want to candidates know when you're excited about the space. Hmm. So my advice to that is figure out where in tech you would be the most excited. And unfortunately, the way that you find out is probably going to be starting off by recruiting all over the place. But mm -hmm. as you recruit all over the place, start figuring out where you want to, where you're most excited about recruiting and where you're most excited about having conversations with the candidates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And then once he chooses the role, then what should be some meaningful number of candidates to have on the list just to have confidence to actually start utilizing them for the business development that you mentioned in the prospecting? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I would say build out your list as like big as possible to start off with, like niche it down into different sectors of like, if, if he's focused on just California, I would try to, I would try to figure out every single DevOps person as an example, that's working in the San Francisco Bay area, build that out as your list to start. If you're in, if you're in Los Angeles, build a list of every single DevOps person in Los Angeles and make that your start, like start reaching out to them, start having conversations, especially with like the DevOps managers, because they're the ones that are going to be like having the hiring need. So I would even niche it down to two options, like the DevOps management side and then just the DevOps like individual contributor side and where you want to have the most conversations are the managers, but you also want to start getting to know the, the, the individual contributor side also. Oh, well, these these uh, tips are golden, really. Like, I, I need to rewatch this again because my my mind is already spinning. From actually, we also do some business development, right? And we are sometimes trying to reach out to a head of HR, sometimes to some CTO. But now, actually, it totally makes sense to, if you know, assuming you focus on DevOps, then reach out to the DevOps manager. I and... mean, you're gonna ha you're gonna have to deal with HR. You're gonna have to deal with like contracts. You're gonna have to deal with all those departments. So you want to be their friends too. But at the end of the day, it's the de uh, the example of the DevOps. It's a DevOps manager that has the openings, and he's the one that has the most pain because mm -hmm. those positions aren't being filled. Yeah, yeah. And now this actually comes back to the personal brand that we started with. So. Um, this uh, recruiter from California, for example, like if he chooses DevOps, then should he also position on LinkedIn as a DevOps recruiter in California, or what? What would you suggest? I mean, absolutely. Like one of the things when it, like, I would definitely put in there, like your your headline, you know, DevOps or uh, the the California DevOps recruiter, or de like make sure it's like you have DevOps recruiting in the, in there because when people are just looking through LinkedIn real quick, they, all they see is a tagline. So I give you a perfect example. I have, um, I have sales navigator up in a window real quick. Cause earlier before we started, we were trying to figure out how many recruiters are in the U S and it's almost like 300,000. And you see like their tagline on a lot of the stuff. So when somebody's scrolling through face, if they're scrolling through LinkedIn, they'll see your name. And then we'll see the tagline first. So make sure it's visible so that way people can see it. Yeah. Yeah. DevOps recruiter. The DevOps recruiter. That's that's very cool. <laughs> I really like yeah. That. And I give you a perfect example of this. We wanted we back when Web3 and crypto was like going huge, we actually tried shifting away from GovCon into crypto and recruiting. I put crypto, blockchain, and stuff in my LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I had people in that space hitting me up. 
So mm. if you start putting like DevOps and you start putting like all that type of stuff in your profile as your solution provider, people will start reaching out to you as a little bit of authority in the space because of that. Mm, nice, nice. <clears throat> and also to start creating articles, as you mentioned. So now it yep. all gets together. So it's uh, it's interesting how the talent pool or the focus on the list is connected with uh, branding. Yeah. And like, if you, if you hate writing articles, hop on and do like a LinkedIn interview and like make that a LinkedIn live and make it like a, the DevOps DevOps weekly where you're interviewing DevOps managers. And here's the secret secret behind that. So as you're interviewing these DevOps managers or managers for a podcast, for a LinkedIn live or for whatever you're doing, you're now also creating those relationships. So when you're sitting there sharing the story of, a, let's say Joe Bob, the DevOps manager, and you're interviewing him it's now populating in his LinkedIn feed. Mm. Of, like, like It's showing in the algorithm of all the managers that he's connected with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a killer, re like podcasting like and doing stuff like this is a killer relationship tool that I think a lot of recruiters are underutilizing. And he, as recruiters, we're already having these conversations. Mm -hmm. So why yeah. not get like, try to get like somebody to say yes to recording it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, why, why I'm not doing this? <laughs> I need to start interviewing also uh, IT managers. That's just, uh, no, no, it, I just have to start with this. It feels like a no-brainer. Um, but, uh, but also people may wonder, okay, but I invite DevOps manager for an interview or a podcast interview, and then what do we talk about? So what, I mean, what do we here's the way I structure, like at least the podcast for me, we have a little bit of a hook and like, if you're a recruiter, you know how to ask good questions. So one of the things, the structure that I like to do when I'm doing like podcast interviews is a little bit of like, we have a hook, like, you know, he's so-and-so for works at this company. And then the first question is like, like, how'd you even get started in that space? And let him tell, tell that story. Okay. You're now working at this company. Tell, tell, like, tell that story. So like, mm -hmm. you just want to kind of ask some good leading questions. And then if you really want to be like a, like a secret agent behind the doors, like I like to kind of section off like the back end of my podcast, I make it like quick fire questions. And those questions are like actionable insights for people in DevOps. Like one of the questions you can ask, like in that quick fire in like actionable areas, like for people that want to grow in their DevOps careers, what advice would you give them? People mm -hmm. that want to become a DevOps manager, what advice would you give them? For DevOps managers that want want to hire some of the best talent out there, what advice would you give them? And you want to like see that's a recruiting question that you're asking. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, where have you found some of your best DevOps like teams? So you want to kind of like, if you want to slide in a few recruiting questions, like, okay, now you know where his pain points are. Now mm -hmm. you know where this is. Mm -hmm. But and then you like you can use like these, there's some awesome tools out there. So you can like record this video on Zoom. You can drop the video into something like Opus Pro or Get Munch, and it uses artificial intelligence to literally like eat your podcast interview and it creates social media clips. So you can have like the, these clips of the manager like talking about his company and they're AI generated. So you're not doing like all the work, the clips of him talking about him being a manager, like some lessons that he learned. And you're now sharing that on LinkedIn. It's popping up on his LinkedIn profile is mm -hmm. now shared with his entire network of other DevOps mm -hmm. managers. So mm -hmm. that's that's like the secret power behind it. Like one, do, just do the interview, have some fun, be a, something that you're interested in, and then use like some AI tools behind the scene to make it look, look awesome. Mm. So then next time he needs to find a DevOps engineer, who will he call? Well, obviously, yep. right? It's and then like, even like follow up after the podcast, like wait like a week or two, like, hey, I saw that you have some openings. Do you guys work with agency recruiters? Oh, yes, we do. Like, perfect. You already have the relationship built out. While there's uh, like 50 other recruiters that have hit him up this week that he's ignored. Mm -hmm. Well, 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 it just feels uh, really like a no brainer. I mean, just do this, 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 and uh, you get clients. So uh, we I mean, it's... It <laughs> we, with a few guys in, in the uh, uh, academy, <laughs> we need to just follow these steps. It's now, you know, when we have it outlined. It, it, it takes a little bit of time, mm -hmm. but it's like, like with how much artificial intelligence out, out there is creating noise, doing mm -hmm. something like this creates this authenticity that people are looking for in relationships and content.
Yeah, yeah. But this is one of the things that actually really like cannot not work, right? Because you focus on DevOps, for example, or Java developers in you know Montreal or whatever, and then you reach out to Java managers, Java backend managers or DevOps managers. You invite them for a podcast, which usually people you know like to to join podcasts as, as guests, and then they remember you even a year or two later. So yeah, um, it's you got to think of the law game. And one of the things about recruiting, we have like the hunting side of the house, and then mm -hmm. we have the farming side of the house. Mm -hmm. If you're, I know a lot of us recruiters kind of fell into the space. Like we, didn't, many of us didn't plan. You know, we weren't like little kids in school or in college planning on being recruiters. So we fell into the space and you got to think about the long game, like hunting, emailing, sourcing, calling, that's hunting. But what can you do down the road that's going to create a harvest and stuff mm -hmm. like podcasts or stuff like interviews and stuff like sharing on social media and on LinkedIn, that is like farming to create a harvest down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like this angle. If we extrapolate it a bit further and you may say, assume that at some point you will want to sell the company. Right. So if you have a good list, if you have a good brand, if you have a podcast with uh, dozens of, of interviews, like if you have the asset actually, which is the list, as you said, then it will be easier to sell the, the agency. But if you start with the, every search every time, then there is not much value in the business. Yeah. It's, I mean, I've, one of the things I've found recently is like some friends of mine that have like sold their companies and stuff like that. It's, it's like you have to learn how to build an asset. And if you're doing a contingent search on a brand new position, that's a different position in every industry. No company will ever buy that as an asset. They'll like mm -hmm. look at it and say it's cool. And it, it and one of the mistakes that you made is like thinking that your sweat equity is the asset. But if you're looking to sell, they don't care about your sweat equity. They care about what they can buy and what has a brand. Mm -hmm. Well, this is an interesting angle. So then totally makes sense to build the list, develop the list with the intent to actually sell it eventually, right? Or probably not everyone wants to sell, but if you if you kind of look at it from the investor standpoint, then it gives you a different uh, angle, if, if we can uh, say so. And like I haven't gone that deep in like when it comes to selling recruiting businesses. I have a few people coming on the podcast soon. But one of the things I, I have done is I've invested in about 80 different companies mm -hmm. through like different like investing like avenues that you can do in the United States. And like you really start looking at like the investment documents, what they're building, the team, all these things. And if they if somebody came at me with uh, some investing documents about their business and they start a brand new search every single time mm -hmm. in a different space, like how is that a viable asset? And <laughs> It, it's so in that. So true. When you say it, it's just so true, really. <laughs> but like at the same time, like recruiting, can, you, you you can build it up, or you can build recruiting to become a lifestyle company too, and that's a whole other option. Mm. Well, well, I feel like I'll need to rewatch this uh, just because it's full of uh, golden insights, and I just hope people uh, listening or watching this will realize it. So, um, um, anyway, you know, um, just to be cautious um, about about your time. What would be the uh, final advice that you would give to people who are out there? They would like to get into the tech. Uh, I know they look at it and uh, they wonder, hey, what do I do? What do I do next? I would say the biggest, like, the two biggest pieces of advice is get on the phone and call somebody. Like call mm -hmm. some people in the in the space. I remember when I first started finding out about different tech stuff, I was really like. You know, I do my research. I do, I hop on LinkedIn articles and like, or in different like industry articles and look at stuff. But I learned the most by actually talking to the people that actually did it. Like, oh, why did you like? Why did you choose DevOps? Why did you go this route? And hearing their stories, and like, and then don't be afraid to like also ask them like, well, why are you working on that project? You know, what are you doing with that project? That's where you you really learn. Mm. And secondly, like one of the coolest things about the recruiting community is the recruiting community gives so much out mm. like it, like a lot of the stuff that i've said on the said on this interview and thank you for bringing me on is stuff that i've actually learned from other recruiters i've taken like a piece here and i've learned that i've taken a piece here and i've learned that i've taken a piece here and that's really almost 20 years and you know most recently i would say the last three or four years of really just trying to 
absorb what's going on and how the recruiting world has changed and where, you know, things that it, what's happening. And it's really, it's because of all those other recruiters out there that I'm kind of just learning also from, mm -hmm. and that's, what's really helped me. Awesome. Awesome. And where can people uh, find uh, you online on LinkedIn most likely, right? But do you also have some website or something that you'd like? So to... most likely uh, the best place is probably LinkedIn. My name is uh, Benjamin Mena. And last name is spelled M-E-N-A. I also have a, a podcast called the Elite Recruiter Podcast. If you see that on like uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, um, it's really we're just, you don't laugh. It's sharing. I'm just sharing stories of other recruiters <laughs> <laughs> and like what they're doing. But yeah, it's like both places are easy to find me, but yeah, definitely LinkedIn. And uh, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm really excited about you growing. I know 2024 is going to be an exceptional year for you. You're going to take what you're learning on this podcast right here. You're going to implement it and you're going to grow to be an exceptional recruiter. And recruiting is one of the coolest careers you can have out there. It is such a blessing of an industry. Awesome. Thanks for, for saying this. Uh, I guess lots of people need it to, to hear it. So, so thanks for, for sharing everything. And yeah. I mean, one last thing, like, think about this. There are a few decisions, major life decisions that people make in their lives, who they marry, where they go to school, where they live, and also what they do. What is mm -hmm. their career? As recruiters, we have an impact in that one major life tr like choice that people have. We are helping pe people's careers. We're helping people's families. Like it is such a, like, if you reframe your thoughts on just filling positions to the impact that you make on a daily basis, it can, it can change your recruiting career. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very, very uh, powerful. Thanks. Thanks for saying and sharing everything. It's, uh, it's been very, very helpful. Even for me now, I have so many ideas, you know, you probably noticed that at some point I'm kind of like half frozen because I'm already thinking, what do I do tomorrow, you know, to, to, uh, implement some of these insights. So, uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks again for, for uh, joining and, um, I'll share the links to your LinkedIn profile so that people can connect with you. Happy to connect and happy to see you guys grow. Awesome. Thank you. See you soon.